and welcome to this brand new edition of Global Lens on News 9 Live with me, Neha Khanna. As always, we have a packed show for you and our focus continues to be on the snowballing diplomatic tussle between India and Canada. The story about the killing of Khalistani terrorist Hardeep Singh Nijar in Canada keeps getting curiouser and curiouser. Why do we say that? Here's why. Canadian media reports now say that Nijar was in regular touch with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, the premier intelligence agency in the North American country. The Canadian media have quoted Nijar's 21-year-old son, Balraj Singh Nijar, as having said that the Khalistan Tiger Force founder had met senior intelligence officials just a couple of days before he was gunned down outside a Gurudwara in British Columbia in June this year. What's more, his son says Hardeep Singh Nijar used to meet with Canadian intelligence officers once or twice a week. The meetings had begun in February. They last met practically on the eve of his murder on the 18th of June. And they also had a meeting scheduled two days later. Canadian news website, National Observer, is among the media outlets who have reported this story. So why is this significant? It's significant because many say what Nijar's son has said lends credence to India's stand that Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, or ISI, was possibly involved in Nijar's killing, which sparked this snowballing diplomatic row between India and Canada. And there are questions that Canada needs to answer. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's first get you more details of this evolving story. Balraj has told this Canadian media outlet that both the father and son used to receive frequent death threats. Balraj has also said that he too had attended one of the meetings where his father met the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who had warned Nijar of the threat to his life and advised him to stay at home. Now remember, Canada had granted Nijar citizenship just months after a red corner notice was issued against him in 2014. As per Interpol, a country has to act on a red corner notice and arrest and deport the accused person to their home country. However, Canada, as we know, simply ignored this and approved Nijar's citizenship application. What more do we know about Nijar? He was wanted in several cases, including the 2007 blast that killed six people in Punjab. The National Investigation Agency had put him on the most wanted list here in India. In 2015 and 2016, fresh cases were filed against Nijar for his role in targeting Hindu leaders. Again in 2018, the NIA was probing Nijar's involvement in the killing of RSS leaders in Punjab. By 2020, India had designated Nijar as a terrorist. None of this ever mattered to Canada. Over the years, India has made at least 25 extradition requests to Canada seeking the handover of Khalistani extremists who have been operating with impunity from Canadian soil. None of them have been accepted by Canada. As is well known, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has triggered a major diplomatic row with India by accusing India of orchestrating the killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar. Of course, not a shred of evidence has been shared to back those claims. Therefore, given the new revelations made by Nijar's son, here are some questions that Canada needs to answer. Just what was the nature of the relationship between the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and Hardeep Singh Nijar? After all, they were meeting practically every week. Was Nijar a Canadian intelligence asset? Was Canada trying to weaponize this Khalistani terrorist? This was a man who had an Interpol red corner notice against him. If there were threats to his life, why did the Canadians not provide Niger security? Was there any Canadian support for the ISI or Niger's killers? Was Niger's killing an ISI plot to hurt India's growing stature on the global stage? Leveling such a serious charge against a fellow democracy and a friendly nation without any tangible evidence is not something any responsible country would do in such a frivolous manner. But then we know Justin Trudeau's track record and he doesn't come out smelling of roses. Trudeau has been accused, and with good reason, of playing venal domestic vote bank politics by pandering to Khalistani terrorists and extremists and becoming an apologist for terrorism and secessionism for his own political survival. But by pointing a finger at India without any corroborative evidence, has Trudeau taken a humongous gamble with a pretty bad hand? 
and have a series of political and diplomatic disasters left Trudeau a very lonely man, both at home and globally. To answer those questions, we are joined on Global Lens tonight by a very special guest. We have with us Terry Miluski, former senior correspondent with CBC News in Canada, and he has written the most authoritative book on the Khalistan movement. He is the author of Blood for Blood, 50 Years of the Global Khalistan Project. Terry Miluski, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us on Global Lens tonight. Uh, I have a whole lot of questions for you, sir. Let's begin uh, with the latest reports that have come out of Canada that have quoted Niger's son, who has said quite explicitly that his father was meeting with Canadian intelligence officers practically on a weekly basis. Do you not believe, sir, that the time has come for Canada to answer some questions, one of which now is, what exactly was the relationship between the Canadian intelligence agencies and Hardeep Singh Nijar? Was he a Canadian intelligence asset? How do you look at these revelations that have been made by his son? Well, first, let me agree with you heartily that it is absolutely past time that the Canadians put their cards on the table and said, and, and produce the goods to show that they have hard evidence and to reveal what that evidence is. And there's no excuse for that. It's absurd that we're still sitting here discussing what might it be when we should know what is it. And the Indians are entitled to know what is it as well. However, uh, I know uh, of no conceivable reason why the Pakistani ISI would not realize that uh, Nijar alive is a far better asset than Nijar dead. I think that the theory that the ISI was somehow involved in his murder uh, verges on the absurd. As for the, the, the question you begin with uh, about the uh, relationship between Nijar and CSIS, as we call it in Canada, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, I think I know a little bit about that. Uh, cast your mind back to, you will recall, uh, a year ago, uh, in July of 22, uh, that Rapunaman Singh Mali, an important figure, a multimillionaire who was the financier, no less, of the Baba Khalsa, the terrorist group uh, that blew up Air India, the Kanishka, in uh, Ju June of 1985. Malik was murdered in a very similar gangland contract hit uh, in uh, July of last year. And uh, he did so after he had flip-flopped spectacularly by sending a gushing letter to Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, praising Mr. Modi for the wonderful things that he had done for the Sikhs. What a great friend he was to the Sikhs, which must have seemed like and did seem like treachery to Malik's former friends in the Khalistani movement. And I'm sorry for all the background, but it's going to be, become very relevant to what I'm going to say next. The, immediately the rumor mill was that uh, Malik had burned his bridges with the Khalistan movement, had made too many enemies. There was a business dispute with what I will call Nijar's camp at the Guru Nanak temple in Surrey. Uh, and it was suspected at the time, according to the local ruler mill, uh, rumor mill, that Malik was wiped out by the Nijar camp in retaliation. There was a lawsuit between the two camps. There was dislike, there was bad blood. There are interviews and speeches in which they trash each other and insult each other. Uh, the theory was not completely without evidence, in other words. And then, of course, when Nijar fell victim to an attack on him, uh, the, the, that same rumor mill had it that, aha, you see, the Malik camp is now getting its revenge. In other words, that it was a local gangland vendetta, a squalid settling of accounts, nothing to do with geopolitics, nothing to do with some international hit squad uh, of uh, deadly diplomats or uh, hired assassins hired by the government of India. So now, why, the next question is, why was it that CSIS appeared to be meeting with Nija? And I'm sorry for the long winding, winding road I've taken to get to that question, which, you, which is where you focused. Well, remember that the Canadian police have a duty to warn. If the police or CSIS have information that suggests that 
retribution may be coming, that we think that we're picking up some chatter. It sounds like Mr. Malik's camp and his family and his, his business associates have got it in for you. We can't not tell you and then have it said after you're killed that we knew. So we've got a duty to warn you. And they did. And guess when these warnings began, according to the latest story, which you cited in your introduction? Oh, it was last July, after the death of Mr. Malik. Now you see where I'm going. That it appears, to me anyway, that there is a clear explanation for why the authorities were meeting with Mr. Nijjar, because he was under threat, there was plotting going on, and they had a duty to warn him. They couldn't not warn him. Now, there may have been other factors to do with uh, the, the uh, enmity between the Indian government and Sikhs for Justice more generally. He was kind of the number two in Sikhs for Justice, which, as you know, is organizing the referendum on Sikh independence under the number one, Mr. Panoon, which raises the question, why would an Indian hit squad go after Mr. Nijjar, number two, but not Number one, Mr. Panoon. There are all kinds of other targets that might have been more significant than Mr. Nidja, but that, that's another question. But I think I have an, a rough idea why the authorities were regularly meeting with Mr. Nidja, and I don't think that it indicates at all that mm -hmm. the uh, Pakistani ISI were involved for any reason. I can see why the Pakistanis might want to keep Nidja alive, not the reverse. Well, thank you, sir, for that comprehensive answer, including a backgrounder. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, you are quite convinced that Pakistan's ISI had nothing to do with Nijjar's shooting. You seem to strongly believe that there was a gang rivalry at play here. Of course, it hasn't occurred to the Canadian Prime Minister that that could be the case because he decided to jump the gun and point a finger at India. But we'll get to that in just a moment. But since you are saying, sir, that you're convinced that all these meetings that were happening between Canadian intelligence officers and Niger were essentially just to warn him because there was a threat to his life, uh, uh, indulge me for a moment, sir. I will play the devil's advocate and ask you a follow-up question. Did Niger really need weekly warnings from the Canadians? to be reminded no. that there was a threat to his life? And if it was such a serious threat, why did the Canadians not provide him any security? That's the right question. I, I agree with you. It doesn't the, the account that I've given you doesn't really explain why they had to meet every week, does it? Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct about that, and I agree with you. But remember also that the Canadians, the Canadian authorities wanted to meet with Nidja for their own purposes. The warnings got them in the door, but they wanted to learn. They wanted to be his friend. They wanted to be close to him. They wanted to learn what he knew about. And Sikhs that is exactly the question I wanted to yes. ask you. Mr. Miluski, I'm so yes. sorry to apologize, uh, to, to, to be interrupting, sir. But, you know, I'm so glad that you have brought this point up because the question that is now being asked in India is, do we need clarity from Canada as to whether this man... Uh, who's at the heart of this diplomatic storm, was actually an intelligence asset for Canada? In that case, the question that also will be asked is, was Canada weaponizing a man who India had designated as a terrorist? He was wanted in multiple cases here, included targeted killings, sir. There was a red corner notice issued against that man by Interpol, no less. And they wanted to learn what he knew. They wanted to learn about the activities of Sikhs for Justice. They wanted to know his contacts. They wanted to know all about what was going on, because that is their job. Sikhs is, is a spy agency. And, uh, and they were cultivating him, it seemed to me, uh, to learn as much as they possibly could about local politics. Remember that uh, Surrey, British Columbia, is a stew of all kinds of plots uh, the, 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 uh, and, and organized crime. Uh, that's, the, that's the main preoccupation of the police and where it acquired this international flavor with a large body of uh, Khalistanis concentrated in Surrey and focusing their anger on, on uh, what was at least then uh, an important ally in India, it would be this, the officer's job to cultivate Mr. Nijjar 
and to find out as much as they could about his activities and those of his leader, Mr. Panoon, and those of his principal lieutenants. Because remember that uh, uh, the CSIS also kept in close contact over many years uh, with the Indian government uh, and through the consulate and through the high commission uh, in response to Indian complaints that we weren't doing enough to keep tabs on Khalistani figures uh, plotting against India. So it's, it makes perfect sense uh, that uh, CSIS would be in touch with both parties to learn what both knew and what they were up to. All right. Uh, fair enough. Let me ask you uh, the next question now, sir. Allow me to um, quote a couple of instances to you. In 2014, according to media reports that came out here in India, Ottawa had turned down intelligence from Indian security agencies on Khalistani terrorists who were operating from Canada on the grounds, and I'm quoting them, sir, that there was no institutionalized mechanism and that intelligence is not evidence. In March this year, when the Trudeau government came under growing pressure from the opposition to investigate foreign interference, read Chinese interference, in Canadian federal elections in 2019 and 2021 that re-elected Justin Trudeau's party, the RCMP, according to the outlet that you've worked with in the past, the CBC, said it wasn't able to run a criminal investigation because intelligence reports do not always translate into evidence. They were right then. So if Canada believes that intelligence is not evidence, what was the Canadian Prime Minister thinking when he decided to speak on the floor of the Canadian Parliament, pointing a finger at India, citing quote-unquote credible allegations and later citing intelligence shared by one of the Five Eyes partners without sharing a shred of evidence till date. We are still waiting. It's a reasonable question, and I think that the, the short answer is the Prime Minister hopes to convert one into the other, doesn't he? He hopes to, cons to convert the leads, the potential link, the credible allegations. He hopes to convert those with further investigation into hard evidence, evidence that somebody who had something to do with the Indian government or maybe used to have something to do with the Indian government, who might have been, had some sort of denial uh, deniable uh, distance from the Indian government. He wants to convert, uh, to continue the investigation with Indian help. That was his original idea, remember. He wanted, with Indian help, to pursue the investigation to make that intelligence, those hints, those suspicions, into hard evidence. And he didn't get there because, according to the Canadian version of this story, the Indians would not cooperate. Initially, the Canadians say they went to, at the official level, weeks before, at many weeks ago, and as Trudeau himself put it when he was visiting the United Nations a couple of days ago. Uh, many weeks ago, he says, and we, the leaks that we have seen in Canada back this up, the Canadians took the matter up with their counterparts in the Indian government, which is what you would expect. Hey, we've picked up this chatter. We've got some uh, hints. Uh, that one of your guys might have been involved in this, your, or maybe more than one, might have been involved in this uh, killing. Uh, will you work with us to uh, figure out what happened? At that point, nobody's accusing the Indian government per se uh, of, of being uh, the masterminds of the killing, only that somebody who had something to do with the government was involved, perhaps without the government's knowledge. But And they say also, this is another important Canadian leak, that during those weeks before the G20, before the meeting with Trudeau and Modi, that brief and frosty meeting in New Delhi at the G20, before all of that, that when they raised this with their Indian counterparts, that the Indian officials did not deny it. They never denied it until the whole thing became public, and then the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of India, Mr. Jai Shankar, uh, they all uh, uh, denied it uh, uh, firmly. So uh, they wanted to, the, the short answer, as I say, is that the, Trudeau hoped to continue that investigation to convert suspicion and intelligence into hard evidence, was frustrated when the Indians declined to cooperate. Presumably that only increased Canadian suspicions that something was up that they didn't know. And uh, so they hit a wall. And so that's when they uh, decided to go public. 
whether that was a wise decision, considering what they had, is now now very much in question because Okay, we've lost the link there to Terry Miluski. We will go back to him. In we just don't know a what moment. they have. Oh, right. hey, we we have him we back up. Guy, which could... Okay, go ahead, Sorry, sir. I, I, my, I, must have, I dropped out there. Uh, so so I, I, I'll conclude my answer, and, and, and I, it sounds like you missed the last 30 seconds or so. It wasn't that uh, interesting anyway. But the, the, again, what the Canadian Prime Minister hoped to do was convert intelligence into evidence. He wanted that the Canadian government generally wanted to get India's cooperation in unearthing the truth and failed to get India's cooperation. That's when they got mad and decided to go public and whether Trudeau can carry it off based on the whatever intelligence he's got, which falls short of hard evidence, is now in question. All right. Now, just for the record, uh, you know, you are saying that Canada's version is India refused to cooperate and they hit a wall and Justin grew, uh, Trudeau grew more and more frustrated. Uh, as you just mentioned, sir, India's external affairs minister is on record as having said India didn't do it. It is not uh, the government of India's policy to engage in such acts. We have told the Canadians, yeah. and I'm quoting him, we have told the Canadians, if you have specific and relevant evidence, share it with us. We are open to looking at it. So far, nothing has come from there. He said this a couple of days ago in New York. So let me ask you this, sir. Since you, and all right. Since you you do agree that you know, maybe it was at best kite flying on part of Justin Trudeau. He was hoping to convert a suspicion slash what he calls intelligence into credible evidence. But frankly, sir, that credible evidence is yet to come to the fore. Therefore, my question is, do you not believe, sir, that Justin Trudeau took a huge risk with a very, very bad hand? This oh, is the yes. question I asked at the yes, start of the show. Absolutely. Absol it, absolutely. Because this uh, look, is not uh, how you Mr. behave with fellow democracies and friendly countries, do you, sir? Well, it, it, uh, we, we don't know about the circumstances that drove him to that decision, but uh, I think you're absolutely correct that he performed a really a spectacular political feat. Uh, and that's his uh, simultaneously painting himself into a corner while putting a noose around his own neck. I mean, he stuck his neck way out. Because if he wasn't able to make this stick, he surely must have foreseen that this would be a disaster to him politically when he's already on very thin ice with the Canadian public and he does not have uh, any more a reservoir of public confidence and support that might carry him through an affair like this. The Canadians would, you know, maintain the faith in our prime minister, even uh, in the absence of hard evidence that he knows what he's talking about. So he, he put himself in a very difficult corner. Um, and I don't think it's easy to understand why he would do that uh, unless he had the goods, unless he had something pretty good. Having said that, I, I want to remind uh, you and your viewers that uh, Mr. Trudeau has uh, displayed some poor judgment on this question in the past. If your assumption is that no prime minister would do this without hard evidence, well, remember his first visit to India in 2018 when he showed... Uh, remember the terrorists that came to dinner on that trip? Remember yes. that the uh, Canadian delegation, um, uh, with, uh, to, amid huge embarrassment, Atwal. turns out yes. to have invited to a, to a dip. Yes, Jaspal Atwal had been invited. A convicted Palestinian terrorist uh, was it somehow invited to dinner at the High Commissioner's residence in New Delhi on Trudeau's official visit. He was going to dine with the Prime Minister and take selfies with the Prime Minister's wife and nobody in the Prime Minister's entourage, including 14 members of Parliament who travelled with him, none of them realised, you know, that might not be a good idea to have a convicted terrorist at the dinner. Uh, or at any dinner, anywhere close to the Prime Minister's absolute madness and a display of very bad judgement on the part of whoever vetted the guest list. Or maybe it wasn't vetted. How did he get anywhere close? How did a Canadian member of Parliament put him on the guest list. Unbelievable. So this forces you to the conclusion that maybe 
the vetting isn't very good. We've just been through a couple of days, have we not? You've had Nazi gate. That the vetting, <laughs> we had Nazi gate in the Canadian uh, Parliament where uh, people are applauding a Nazi. Oh, oops, oops, we, we, we blew that one. We didn't know he was a Nazi. Somebody didn't check, and uh, that blew up, and that, there's more egg on Trudeau's face. So uh, it's, you can't carry this argument very, fair that, uh, very far that no prime minister would do such a thing without hard evidence. Well, uh, this prime minister has uh, had a few failures of judgment uh, that um, uh, give you pause. There's no question about that. Okay. I, I want to ask you this question. You are accusing him of poor judgment. Uh, you talked about how this convicted Khalasani terrorist was at the Justin Trudeau dinner here in India. Let's also not forget, sir, that in 2017, correct me if I'm wrong, because nobody understands the Khalistan movement better than you, Justin Trudeau's government actually acquitted the only man who had been convicted in the 1985 Kanishka Air India bombings that had left 331 people dead and was the worst terror attack in Canadian history. Now, my question is this, sir. Uh, again, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Are you being a little charitable towards the Canadian Prime Minister when you accuse him of, uh, you know, an error of judgment and maybe being politically naive and jumping the gun? Because let's face it, sir, Justin Trudeau has been accused repeatedly by India and with good reason for playing venal and cynical domestic vote bank politics by pandering to this constituency of pro-Khalistan extremists and terrorists for his own political survival. We know about Jagmeet Singh and how much sway he has over this government. And it seems as if Trudeau cannot see beyond his nose. But this is a prime minister of a democracy who today is seen not just by India, but by many around the world, sir, as being an apologist for terrorism and secessionism. How would you respond to that? It's not okay. just error first, of judgment, uh, sir. Please forgive me. I, 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 agree, I agree with you. But first, let me just dispose of the, the remark you made about the only person ever convicted in the Air India bombing. He was not acquitted. He was never acquitted. In fact, he spent the better part of 30 years in prison. Uh, he was sentenced to a total of 34 years. He served about 29 uh, for the Air India bombing and for perjury in the cover-up of that plot. Uh, so that, 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 that was simply uh, wrong information. However, on the main thrust of your question, I believe that you are absolutely correct, and there is no question that there has been craven vote bank politics played uh, by the Liberal Party, as it has been in the past by other parties, uh, in this matter and in many others. The alteration of a terrorism report to remove the offending words of Khalistan extremism. Oh, the World Sikh Organization objects to that language, then we'll change the report to please them. What has happened in the uh, Trudeau administration is that the uh, vote bank politics has been uh, uh, exploited uh, because of uh, Jagmeet Singh's influence over the government. He has a pledge to support the government, and as you know, he's a Khalistani sympathizer. He used to go around telling people that, oh, no, the Khalistanis didn't blow up Air India back in 1985. It was done by the Indian government itself. Uh, it was a false flag operation. He's an Air India truther, as we call it, uh, claiming uh, it completely and plausibly, and in defiance of all the evidence that India blew up its own plane, supposedly to make the Sikhs look bad or some uh, uh, crazy theory. Uh, which, which is, uh, runs absolutely counter, I assure you, to all the evidence. But I'll spare you that. Now the problem is that it's been exposed. Everyone has been guilty. All the parties have been guilty in the past of this. Look, I will go to your Vaisakhi parade while I'm running for office. And I'm going to smile and wave as the parade floats go by with uh, pictures garlanded with tinsel of gun-toting Sikh assassins and martyrs and mass murderers to include even the mastermind of the Air India plot. Uh, and I will just look the other way and not say a word uh, while these floats go by. That's the deal. And you, in turn, uh, will reward me uh, by uh, bringing me a, a nice block of 10,000 votes at election time. It's been a nice little arrangement, and it must now come to an end because it has poisoned Canadian politics.
because we should not be editing factual reports issued uh, by professional uh, uh, CSIS and other officials of public safety and security. We should not be editing them to please any, uh, any lobby group. Uh, and that did happen. We should not be inviting terrorists to dinner with the prime minister. Uh, there are, we, we should not have Palestinian sympathizers in the federal cabinet. And we must reform all of the problems, the toleration of uh, terrorist propaganda, Palestinian propaganda, the martyr posters, uh, the diorama of the assassination, celebrating the assassination of Indira Gandhi, uh, and uh, the, uh, the appalling profusion of videos that are pumped out uh, and produced in Canada, many of them, uh, in favor of uh, the Khalistani movement. Uh, something needs to be done about that, and for starters, Canada needs to update its legislation to outlaw the glorification of terrorism, which is legal in Canada. All of this has been normalized in Canada, and action has to be taken to show to the Indians that we get it. We understand your concerns about Canada's attitude and the vote bank politics that lie behind it, and we're going to change. Now, that doesn't mean that it's okay if it turns out that India was somehow involved in the assassination of Mr. Nidja. But it's a start. Somehow, the relationship must be rescued. It must be restored. This ship must be brought to safe harbor somehow. We can't go on like this yelling at each other and uh, dueling leaks. Uh, but uh, as a start, Canada needs to take the first step and say, look, uh, we have indulged these people far too much. We let them off the hook too many times, and we're going to fix that. We're going to do something about it. That would be a good start. It will be a good start, but is Justin Trudeau listening? I wish he was listening to you. You know, uh, I, yeah. you know <laughs> what, what's really infuriated India over the years, and this is the reason why Justin Trudeau got snubbed in the manner that he did on both his visits to India in 2018, um, and uh, this time for the G20 summit. Uh, like I said, Justin Trudeau is increasingly seen um, as a figure in India who has condoned um, you know, the activities of pro-Khalistan extremists and terrorists for the sake of vote bank politics. Many say this is peak duplicity, sir, when it comes to diplomacy and geopolitics. And I've said this all week on my show. I want to say it one more time to you and ask you if you agree with me on this. What do I mean by duplicity? Is Justin Trudeau trying to tell us that, you know, our terrorist is a terrorist, but your terrorist is our plumber? That is not going to wash in India anymore. No, and I, and I think, it, it, I mean, there may be something useful to come out of this. I think we agree. Namely, that Canada finally gets it. I did a, look. I, I did a, a documentary 20 years ago called Safe Haven, arguing that Canada was uh, allowing terrorists to run rampant, uh, and that the Air India bombers, for example, had chosen wisely when they chose Canada for their safe haven. They got away with it. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, just before he was first elected and became prime minister in 2014, I did a story about a, a nomination battle in Vancouver, uh, where the uh, will of the local supporters of the Liberal Party was frustrated. They had a moderate candidate who was, uh, uh, had the lead in the nomination race, but the party brass, meaning uh, the former president of the World Sikh Organization, a separatist group, and uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, together they foisted upon the local writing association in Vancouver South uh, a, a candidate who was more to their liking and more to the WSO's liking. And then when I asked Trudeau about it, he said, well, that's democracy. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And one of his aides said to me, well, Terry, I suppose you're going to do a story about the Sikhs taking over the Liberal Party, as though there's, there was some sort of a racism involved here. I was against Sikhs. The whole story, of course, was about how the Liberal Sikhs in that writing were walking out of the Liberal Party, not taking it over, but leaving in protest against the, the, the pronounced a favoritism by the party press of more hardline, more Khalistani candidates. So Trudeau has a bad record on this file. He has a record of pandering. There's no question about it, and it's got to end. I mean, uh, 
people now see see it for what it is. And people, Canadians realize that his government is in hock uh, to a party led by a Khalistani sympathizer. They don't want to see this happen. And uh, the, the conservatives uh, are starting to put their finger in the wind and realize that although they in the, in the past have played the same game of vote bank, bank politics, that there may be an electoral advantage to them, a better chance for their man to become prime minister by ending that policy and instead making clear that they are listening to India's complaints and will act upon them, take a different attitude, for example, to extradition requests, and stop just saying that whatever they do, whatever they say, is, oh, it's free expression, it's free expression. I'm in favor of free expression. Most Canadians are. The Western democracies are not going to abolish free speech in order to please the Indians. But when it crosses the line into the incitement of terrorism, and the glorification of terrorism, that has got to be stopped, and we need to update our legislation to do that. Absolutely, you said it. That line was unfortunately crossed a long time ago. You know, again, yes. what has really angered India is what Justin Trudeau goes on defending in the name of freedom of speech aren't just some random statements made here and there, sir. We are talking about calls for violence, incitement to violence. Our diplomats yes. have been threatened openly by the knights, likes of Nijar and Panun. Just recently, Panun issued a video that went viral where he threatened Hindus in Canada asking them to leave yes. that country. These men, sir, are wanted in India for targeted killings of Hindus yes. and Christians in the state of Punjab. This crossed the line of freedom of expression ages ago. But I want to ask you another question, Absolutely. sir. Absolutely. I want to ask you another question, since you have written the most definitive book on the Khalistan movement. I'm sure you would agree, sir, that most in India actually feel that the Khalistan movement in this country is all but dead. The only country yes. that has kept it un alive, unfortunately, sir, is your country, thanks to your prime minister and his venal politics. If you could share with us, sir, for the benefit of our viewers, your insight into where the Khalistan movement really stands today. The Khalistan movement is heading for a brick wall. And I say that because uh, of the referendum, which they have managed to drag out for years now, uh, months go by, then they have a vote in another uh, city or another country, months go by, then they have another one, another one, and COVID slowed it down. This was referendum 2020, remember? Uh, well, that was three years ago. Now we're going to be four years. And uh, the reason they're going so slow, because they know that they are running into a brick wall. What that means is that if, and this is the theory of the referendum, that if they show that they have a great turnout, strong support in the, in the Sikh diaspora all over the world, in Australia, in Germany, in Italy, in the UK, and in the US, if they show that, then the theory is that uh, Gopatran Singh Panun, the leader of Sikhs of Justice, will then go to the United Nations with the wind in his sails and say to the UN, you see, you see, we've got powerful support. We want a UN endorsement uh, for a uh, referendum to be carried out in Punjab itself. Well, number one, India is not going to allow a referendum in Punjab itself. Number two, there will be no call for such a referendum among the Sikhs in Punjab because they've had it with the Khalistan movement 30 years ago. They don't want to go that, down that road again. Every family remembers the carnage that took well over 20,000 lives, mostly Sikhs, by the way, in the, the uh, Khalistani insurgency of the 1980s and the early 90s. The last vote, uh, the election in Punjab last year, resulted in a pitiful 2.5% of the vote and zero seats for the only separatist party running. And the previous election, they got zero 0.3% of the vote, none of the above. Nota got more votes than the separatists did in a Sikh majority state, where 58% of the voters are Sikh. So there's no support left. It's not, it's not as though, well, they, they're not doing well in Punjab. I mean, they're going nowhere. They're almost imperceptible. They're not moving the needle. This has been going nowhere for 30 years in Punjab. So all of that persuades me 
that the future uh, for the Khalistan movement is grim indeed. It is a, 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 a nice for raising money. Uh, it's nice for getting parades. Uh, but it's not supported by uh, the majority of the world Sikhs. And without that support, it's going to run into a brick wall, even if they have the uh, strategic advantage of being banned by India. They can say, you know, you see, we see we're persecuted. Uh, this is Indian repression. That's why we didn't get the vote out uh, in, in Punjab. Well, if they, did get the, if they do get the vote out, they're sunk because there's no support for it. And if they don't get the vote out, then the, the, they run into the same brick wall, don't they? If, they? if there's ever a vote in Punjab on this question, which there won't be, uh, uh, they'll, they'll lose it. So I would say India would be probably uh, well advised, not that they're going to listen to me, uh, <laughs> to have the they'd referendum. be well advised to just to, to, to let it happen, because the sooner they let it happen, the sooner it will fail. It will, they will fall flat on their face. You know, that's I why they're delaying. <laughs> I don't speak for the government of India. I'm just a journalist, but I can assure you, sir, that is not happening. Not in our lifetime. I don't think it's going to happen. And, and beyond. Uh, you know, um, and uh, uh, I think it is well documented, sir, that a majority of Sikhs are peace-loving people. They are not supporters or sympathizers of Khalistan. Most of them do swear their allegiance to India. And if you, uh, you know, would allow me to be facetious for just a moment, there are some who've also suggested that if Justin Trudeau is so sympathetic to the Khalistani cause, why doesn't he let them create a Khalistan in Canada? That will be problem solved. Everyone will be happy. But clearly, this is all about votes. Now let me ask you a serious question, which is this. Justin Trudeau's uh, approval ratings are plummeting by the day back home. The opposition leader is snapping at his heels. Um, you know, there are a lot of Canadians today, sir, who actually have said we are embarrassed by what our prime minister has done. Just yesterday, we had a Canadian journalist, Daniel Boardman, on this show, who said we are embarrassed by what he has done. The question really is, how do you think this is playing out domestically, politically for Justin Trudeau? The next election is still uh, a couple of years away. How is this playing out? Well, it's a, yeah, well, it's, it, it's a high wire act. This is uh, Trudeau's last hurrah. Uh, the, if he pulls this off, if he lands this plane safely and produces goods that show that he was right to raise this problem and that the India was somehow involved in assassinating a Canadian citizen, then uh, I, I guess he might pull, uh, pull this one out of the fire. But otherwise, I think that uh, Canadians are already uh, tired of him. Uh, Canadian prime ministers usually don't last much more than nine years, ten years at the most. Uh, that has been true in recent history of Mulroney, of Chrétien, uh, of Stephen Harper. I think he made it to nine years. And Trudeau's on his eighth year now. He uh, became prime minister in 2015. Uh, and there probably would normally be an election next year, and I wonder now if he's going to even last that long, as we, as we said earlier. So I think that he's on borrowed time now. He's looking at the end of his uh, career as prime minister. Uh, and that will come suddenly if he fails in this endeavor, uh, if he has not got the evidence or the evidence turns out to be baloney. Uh, and if he succeeds, it's still not, in, not assured. Because remember that for all the Indians who are saying to themselves today, you know what, I'm more likely to vote for Modi today because he did, took no pity on a wanted terrorist. There are Canadians, too, who feel the same way. So that even if Trudeau establishes that India crossed the border and committed murder on Canadian soil, an obvious violation of our sovereignty and of international law, there will be many Canadians who say, I'm not going to cry for Niger because you know what the unintended effect of these recent events have been. Canadians don't, haven't been paying attention to the Khalistan movement. It's not on the front pages. There's just a few nerds like me who follow this. It's not a threat to Canada or to Canadians. They don't pay attention. They've got other concerns. So they look at this and they say, well, who's this guy Niger anyway? And now they are taking an interest because it's front page news they learn, oh, here's a speech by Mr. Nijer in which he rails his praise 
for the assassins of Indira Gandhi and for the assassins of General Vaidya and the assassins of Bayant Singh, the chief minister of Punjab, and on and on and on. He's preaching violence. Well, they didn't know that before. Now they do. So what I'm saying is that even if Trudeau does, as I put it, land the plane safely and produce the goods and show that India was indeed involved, it doesn't necessarily mean that Canadians are going to shed tears for Mr. Nijjar or for his like. Uh, they may decide that the Khalistan movement has cost us too much. They may decide they don't want to see martyr pictures pasted on the outside of, of the Gurdwara and uh, parades going through downtown Toronto with pictures of Indian diplomats calling them killers and tempting people uh, with cash rewards for revealing the home addresses of these diplomats, tempting them to maybe go after these diplomats if they're so minded. What happens when a kid with a gun or a knife uh, gets the idea that is indicated by those posters or wants the reward for revealing their home address? So I, I, I think it's not a given that Trudeau will survive this even if he does produce the goods. And if he doesn't, I think it's certain that he won't survive politically. Very interesting. You're saying this may well be the end of his career as prime minister. I'm glad you said what you did because it now seems as if Trudeau is exposing his own agenda before the Canadian people and the international community. I promise you, sir, my last one or two questions to you before we let you go. Um, you know, America's relationship with India is very, very important at this point in time. We've seen how much the Biden administration has invested in this relationship in recent times. You know, Prime Minister Modi's historic state visit to Washington. Um, you know, President Biden, of course, was here for the G20 summit, which was seen as a grand success for India, really. Uh, everyone rallied around India in that sense. You know, there are many um, commentators, not just in India, but even abroad, who say today, that there may be this long-standing alliance between the United States and Canada, or between Canada and you know other Western countries. But at this point, it doesn't seem like a country like the United States would want to jeopardize its relationship with India, especially given the growing China threat. Therefore, sir, my question to you is, and we have to keep reminding ourselves, the man has only leveled allegations, no evidence, to back those allegations. Therefore, my question to you is, do you think Trudeau might be learning the hard way that he's messed with the wrong country at the wrong time? Uh, yes, uh, to some degree, I think that's quite true that uh, uh, India, let's face it, has vastly more political clout than it used to. If you used to think as a, of India as a poor country that needed help, well, <laughs> not anymore. You know, wake up. Uh, India is with us. It's the most already the most populous a country in the world. It's vital to everybody's future, and the West desperately wants to keep India in the tent, if I can put it that way, the Western tent that is uh, as our bulwark against China. That, that we want to be shoulder to shoulder with India, and that is of great importance, and it affects this current controversy over Trudeau and Khalistan uh, because uh, they got more. Uh, India has more political clout than Canada does. I mean, you know, it's got this vast population uh, we cannot compare. We cannot, uh, if, if the allies are forced to choose uh, but their allies between Canada and India, well, it's not obvious they're going to choose Canada, is it? Because, you know, they all want a free trade agreement. We were almost there uh, with the free trade agreement. Now that whole idea is out the window. Now, having said all of that, let me just add something. Remember that what animates the Western allies, what holds them together, are liberal democratic ideas, democracy, the rule of law, equality before the law, human rights, free speech, all of that. These are nice ideas, yes, but they're more than nice ideas. They are the animating ideas. Those are the ideas, the principles that hold the allies together. Trudeau, who imagines himself to be a, and believes himself to be a classical liberal, the, the son of Pierre Trudeau, who was a classical liberal uh, law professor, minister of justice, he believes himself to be the inheritor of that great tradition of Western democracy, human rights, the rule of law, equality before the law. And he is defending a principle that all of the allies will still consider very important, even as they calculate the political clout that India has. It's not, it's, that's not the only factor that will uh, uh, 
have influenced that judgment. The idea that one country is allowed to cross into another country, do what it wants, break the law, commit murder, and then leave, and yet that's okay. That's not an idea the Western allies can live with. I mean, wh wh why, not, wh why not support the Russians doing that in Ukraine? Crossing the border, committing crimes, killing people? I mean, uh, th that's writ large, but well, this, the, this I'm sorry, sir, stand. Uh, to interrupt you, they and I'm not... stand for it. Okay, I'm not saying for a moment that this is justified or that India did it, but, you know, the United States, everybody knows the number of targeted killings they have carried out in yes, our country. From course. Osama bin yes. Laden and, and in Abu Dhabi in Pakistan to, uh, you know, Soleimani in Iraq. It's a very, very long yes. list, but I don't have the time to go over that, which is why the West is constantly accused of hypocrisy. Our external affairs minister talked about how this cherry picking is not going to work anymore. Uh, and I also believe that Justin Trudeau may have got the definition of human rights and freedom of speech wrong. But final question, sir, before we let you go. In recent times, Justin Trudeau, uh, whose unpopularity is growing domestically has angered India, he's angered Poland, he's managed to anger the Jews, China most definitely, the Canadian Muslims. It's a very long list. Any guesses as to who he might upset next? And also, do you believe that Justin Trudeau is a rather lonely man today on the global stage? Well, I think he's going through a very hard time, yes. I mean, I think that the, the uh, lukewarm reaction of the Allies that we just discussed uh, affected him. Uh, I think that he's uh, got to be very concerned about his standing a as a result of that. Uh, who knows who he's going to offend uh, next? Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, his career hangs on uh, bringing this affair to a, a relatively okay conclusion. But as I said earlier, I don't think there is uh, a, a, a really happy ending. There's a sort of maybe a little bit happy ending uh, uh, possible for him, uh, but a brilliant future, uh, even if he succeeds, I think he's still going to have problems. I think that he has, uh, he, he's botted his copybook uh, too many times, and that, and that simply put, Canadians are tired of him and they're looking for a change, just so they can get tired of the next guy. Uh, it, it's like any other democracy. But the fundamental thing is that the obligation is still on his shoulders. He will, he will not even begin to get out of this affair until he relieves himself of that burden on his shoulders of producing the evidence. He's got to persuade Canadians first and people around the world second that there really was hard evidence for the accusation that he made against the Indians. And if he doesn't have that, I think it's, he's going to be history. All right. On that note, Terry Miluski, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, sir for so patiently answering my long list of questions and sharing your insights with us on what is clearly turning out to be a diplomatic disaster for Justin Trudeau. And thank you for listening to my long answers. <laughs> we appreciate your perspective and your time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have on Global Lens tonight. If you have been, thanks so much for watching. Do join us again at the same time tomorrow. Good night.